our organization specializes in working with people with disability. And we were originally set up, now 11 years ago, to work specifically and find work placements and roles for people who are living with a disability. And I think that whole thing has evolved and we've grown to the point that now we are working with corporate organizations in order to manage disability within their workplace. We are supporting people and giving them the tools in order to work with people with disabilities. We're finding still work placements permanent and also learnership opportunities for people with disabilities. So our sort of spectrum of what we do has grown from such a small thing into quite a large venture where we kind of cover all areas around disability and now we're all spreading out towards diversity as a whole. But obviously Media24 currently is embarking on another audit where they just want to start to get a little bit more of an understanding of what the demographic is within the workplace environment and you know understand that as a country we are really diverse. We have been asked um, by the government to obviously transform in line with the demographics of our country and ensure that each of our workplaces are representative of that as well as completely inclusive of all of those areas. The areas that generally we want to measure through the audit is things such as the number of people of different races within the organization, the understanding a little bit about the gender separation within the organization, and for most of us, that's easy, you know, we know we're male, female, transgender, we know where we are, we know what our race is, and we generally know our nationality. But when it comes to disability, particularly for people who haven't had exposure to working with someone with a disability or really understanding what the Employment Equity Act says and what the definition is and what defines a disability. And so that's where I suppose this is going to give you a better understanding because there, this audit process is going to happen and we, you may have as managers staff that are coming forward to you to ask you a little bit more about how to do this or whether their condition would fall within that. So it's giving you guidelines on how and what defines a disability, what the law says about disability within the workplace context. Okay, definition of disability and again that's what the Employment Equity Act, how that defines it. Because disability can be defined in so many different ways depending on what aspect you're looking at. Um, obviously appropriate terminology and really from a management point of view that's very important because the staff and the people that are working with you are going to be looking to you for guidance on how to manage that, on how to interact. And it is important that you are able to use the right words and act in the right way using best practice at all times so that that creates a sort of viral change within the organization where people will take you from you and obviously that should hopefully filter throughout the organization and make it a great place to work, an inclusive place to work where everybody within the organization is treated equal and managed at the same level. Okay? Um, oh, it says overriding best practice uh, principles. That should say overriding best practice principles. Um, again, we're just looking at what the law says, what the codes of good practice tell us about how to manage disability and reasonable accommodation. So we'll go into more detail, understanding a little bit about what it is, uh, why we have to implement it, what the reasoning behind it is, and some examples of it so that you can start to understand a little bit more. Um, confidentiality and disclosure I think is really important because that's where staff are going to be looking to you, to HR, to have that bit of confidence about what's going to happen with my information, why should I go through this process, okay? And then obviously the process, so just a little bit of a chat about how we go through the audit process, what we will be doing to support Media24 and how they are going to manage it going forward. So the stages of how the audit's going to happen, okay? I'm jumping backwards and forwards, but I think that one's important to do first. Um, the reason, principles behind really what we're doing and why Media24 take this very seriously is that they want to better understand the demographic, as I said, having a greater understanding of how the workforce is broken up. 
Um, removing barriers within the organisation, including attitudes towards people with disabilities. Um, and I think the barrier thing is something quite often we think of a barrier for a disability is we think someone in a wheelchair gets to a set of stairs. Now what are they going to do? But we don't think about the attitudes that create barriers for people. And so we'll start to look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, and then obviously to assist employees with disabilities because once we know and people have come forward and said to us, look, I'm living with a disability. We need to, as an organization and as managers, understand what our role is and how we need to be responsible to ensure that we're getting, giving everybody an equal opportunity to work and to be able to reach their full potential. And in doing that, it's about looking at the reasonable accommodation and we'll go through that in a little bit of detail, okay? And then obviously the impact on transformation with reference to employment equity and the triple BEE legislation, okay? And the employment equity area says that people, you know, with disabilities were pretty much, well, there were three areas where through the investigation and research it found that there were three areas of people that were previously the most discriminated against and in the workplace's environment. And that was people of color, people with disabilities and women. So understanding that employment equity part allows us and the organization to manage that part of their scorecard, okay? And understand and ensure that they are transforming their com company to be in line with what's expected. We all have stereotypes. All over, we, you know, wherever we're coming from, we've got stereotypes that will come from our religious beliefs, perhaps our cultural upbringing, the areas where we lived. I mean, I'm from Benoni, and quite often my friends from the north are like, oh, the Far East, you live in the Far East, we need a passport to go there. But that's just the presumptions that then, and we laugh and joke about it. And most of the stereotypes are like that. We think about them and we, there's an element of perhaps truth that came from them at some point, but we don't own them. We didn't make them up. We didn't decide what they were. They are just out there, okay? And so we don't really take responsibility for them because for me to say pink is a girly color because that's a stereotype, it's not my presumption. It's just what's out there, okay? But the difference is that when we actually start to change those from stereotypes into our own beliefs, they now run the risk of becoming our prejudice. And this is quite strong in the cultural sense, okay? Our upbringings and things that we are taught that run from our generation to generation, we're taught a certain thing about a certain person, we're taught perhaps if somebody with a disability, don't look at them, don't stare, don't, you know, stay away, don't interact, or that kind of thing through our upbringing. And eventually, if your grandmother's told you that, and your mother's told you that, and everybody else in your society behaves in a particular way, you start to take on that trait. And you start to own that now, because that has changed from a stereotype into a prejudice that we have, okay? And that's when we now run the risk of starting to act on it. And from this training, we hope to sort of look at a little bit of best practice about how we can stop that. And just a simple example, okay? I do this training whew, six or seven times a week. And as I said, on most sessions, people will say to me 80, 90%, right, for all the colors. So technically, I could start to go, do you know what? That is so accurate. And actually, I believe now that all pink people are on the phone all the time. So by going to Jasmine and taking her phone away, I've acted on something that was a stereotype that became my belief and my behavior now discriminated against you. And so particularly when you're looking at managing disability in the workplace, we need to understand that we need to look at it more from a, a perspective of something called the social model. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about the medical model, but the medical model looks at disability as a condition that needs to be cured or treated. Okay? The social model tells us that we need to look at disability as part of the normal human experience. It's part of our society. 
probably 15 to 18 percent of South African population are living with a disability. So that's quite a high number. And so it may not be always physical disabilities that we see, but it may be disabilities like mental health, that people may not look disabled. They may not look like they are having a disability, but they're going to be in your space perhaps, and they may come and want to talk about that. So we need to understand that disability is going to be part of our experience within the workplace. And I think Media24 want to move to that point where we're comfortable working with managing at a level with all of our staff, whether they are people, able-bodied people within our departments or people with disabilities. A disability is something that's caused by an accident, trauma, genetics, or disease. Also age, we all kind of get to that point that we lose a bit of function as we get older. But it limits a person's mobility, hearing, speech, intellect, or emotional, and emotional functions, okay? And that is just a sort of general idea, but this is the important one. This is the definition that the Employment Equity Act defines. And this is in relation to people with disabilities in a workplace or looking for work. And it says that people with disabilities are people who have a long-term or recurring physical or mental impairment, um, which substantially limits their prospects of entry into or advancement in employment, okay? So there's three parts to that. And this is where, you know, through the disability and equity audit that will be happening, this is the definition that we're going to be looking at in terms of whether a person actually meets the criteria. Um, because there's no definite yes or no tick list of conditions that may be a disability, okay? It's all down to this, this, this definition and how it impacts on a person's ability to do their job. So the first part is that it's a long-term or recurring condition, and that being that long-term is something that has existed or is likely to exist for longer than 12 months, okay? And then recurring means that although it may be controlled or not persistent, it's never going to be cured. So something like epilepsy where it's managed with your medication, but that doesn't mean that you're never going to have a seizure again. So it's about it's going to be an, on a cycle or it's a recurring condition, okay? And then it's a physical or mental impairment. So physical, anything that is not working to its normal ability within the body or within the brain is your mental. And then this last bit is the most important bit because it says that because of your condition, because of those other criteria, you may be disadvantaged when you're trying to get a job. When you're in a workplace environment, you may be at a disadvantage when you're perhaps applying to go into a management or a higher role. And the technical guidelines um, that come along with this actually define it a little bit clearer as well for people in your work environment because it says, if it has a substantial impact on your ability to do the inherent tasks related to your job. So that says, if your job is as just a simple example as a typist and you lose an arm in an accident, it is going to impact. It's a physical impairment and it is long term and it is going to substantially impact on your ability to do your job because now although you can still type, your speed may not be the same. Your ability to file and manage things is not going to be the same as it was before. And it doesn't mean you can't do your job, but it's impacting on your ability to do it as an able-bodied person would. These are the exclusions, and believe me, this is what it actually says in the Act, so some of them are quite strange. Um, it says exclusions, the wearing of spectacles or contact lenses unless the person's vision remains substantially impaired. Um, then the next one says compulsive gambling, tendency to steal or light fires. Um, sexual behavior disorders against public policy, so I can't exactly sort of come in streaking and say it's because I've got a disability. Um, disorders that affect a person's mental or physical state by the current use of illegal drugs or alcohol unless the person's participating in a recognized program of treatment. And then obviously your normal deviations in height, weight, strength and conventional mental and physical characteristics and common personality traits. So generally these kind of things are the, where in most cases you are not going to have a disability. Terminology, I just want to talk briefly because I think this part's quite important. We'll go through this and then just give it a little more examples. In the past, 
we, the perspective of disability, I think, has changed so much over the last even 10 years. And years ago, people with disabilities were really considered victims. They were considered to be people that perhaps needed treatment. We looked at ways that we could cure them. And rather than looking at and accepting the fact that someone has a disability, and how do we integrate them into our society? And so the language that we've used has changed so much. Um, I don't know if any of you sort of remember. I remember years ago watching things like Red Nose Day, where they were talking about, welcome onto the stage, all of these handicapped children. And now you say handicap, oh, that's not a word that is sort of used correctly anymore. It's a word that we wouldn't use when we're talking about somebody with a disability. OK, other words that quite commonly before we used is words like cripple. And even the association for people with disabilities used to be the association for the crippled. So it shows that you know it was acceptable at a time, but language has changed so much. And really the most important thing when you're talking about disability is that we just remember to put the person first. It's a simple rule, and if that's the only thing that you really hugely take away from today, then that's great, because that's the most important thing, is that we look at the person first. So we talk about a person with a disability, not a disabled person. Because by saying the word disabled means you're not able. And that person is able. They're a person who happens to have a disability. So it's going to the point of a person using a wheelchair, or a person with epilepsy, or a lady with a mental health condition, rather than an epileptic or a schizophrenic, or because by that, we're defining the person by their condition. And that in itself is kind of, I suppose, in a level patronizing and a bit sort of derogatory towards the person. So if anything, we just look at that person with a condition. And that's the best way that we talk about it. OK. Um, let's go on here. Reasonable accommodation. This is not reasonable accommodation. Um, it is a term that literally means we need to look at what people are going to need. And in order for us to make some changes to their work environments, uh, to the way or the tasks that we're asking somebody to do. But ultimately, a person has to initially have the skill. If a person is doing a job, then if they have a disability, whether it's something that they currently have or something that through an accident or an injury they incur, that's when we need to look at how can we reasonably accommodate. And reasonable accommodation can be so simple. It can be around changing the layout of a work desk. And I'm using the example again if, if I lose my right arm in an accident. Okay? My desk is now set up with my mouse on the right-hand side, my phone here with a handle. And so reasonable accommodation for me to be able to work would be a wireless mouse that I can use with my left hand, a phone that perhaps has a headset so that I'm able to now not hold the phone and take a message. I've got the headset, which allows me then to write. So those are simple things, but the reasonable accommodation is so important because that's taking away the barriers that are there. Without that, that, a person's not able to do their job, or it is impacting on their ability to do it to the best of their potential. And it's very important when we talk about reasonable accommodation because it's not a penalty or something that we're doing as an imposing on somebody. It's their choice, it's non-discriminatory, and it's affirmative action. So it's a positive approach that we're taking to manage and support somebody within a work environment. And it really is, you know, really to reduce the impact of the impairment on the person's ability to do the inherent tasks and the essential functions. Okay. And that could be, you know, in terms of somebody using a wheelchair, it's about what's the environment. Is the environment accessible for them in terms of bathroom facilities, in terms of the layout of the desk? Can a wheelchair fit comfortably under the height of that desk? Are your work areas, have they got a wide enough walk area? So 
that somebody with a wheelchair is going to have access around those. And I think from the sort of general layout of the building, it is quite friendly in terms of wheelchair, etc. But you need to then always be aware that not everybody's going to have the same needs. And so it's also to remember that reasonable accommodation is very individual. And each person with a disability is entitled to have an assessment, have a chat around what their needs are and how they can implement them. But just the process is briefly. Media24 want to encourage all employees to participate in the process by filling in the EEA1 form. Now I know that Sharon put this together but I know that you're doing the electronic tool. So there will be an electronic tool that each staff member will have access to. All staff should fill it in, okay? Whether you are living with a disability or not because it's not just about gathering the disability information. It's about also taking in the information about it asks you to state your gender, your race, your nationality. And so all of those areas are relevant in information. So whether you are living with a disability or not, we're encouraging all staff to go in and fill that in. Okay? It's going to be the process and the link for that is going to be available at the beginning of April. Um, oh, of April, of March. Mm, okay, I got that this morning. And end in the sort of middle of April. So we've got about a two week window where we're asking people to take the time and it's, it's going to take a minute to go through this process. Okay? And all that we're doing is going yes or no and filling in the other relevant information. And so it is important, as I say, and I think our role particularly as managers is to make sure that we're encouraging everybody to participate and making them and sharing the understanding that the reason we're doing this is to, to gather information, to look at what supports are needed, to look at and encourage people that may have a disability to disclose and talk to us about it so that we can understand and support that person and as best as possible, okay? But again, it's a voluntary process. So although we can say to people it is compulsory that you take the time to fill the form in, we can't say to somebody, you must disclose that you have a disability, okay? And that information is going to be managed by progression. So when you fill in that form, it comes through to us. So our first sort of point of call is to manage the responses that come in, okay? And it won't go through to HR until the point that we have verified each person. So everybody that has disclosed yes, we will get in touch with by telephone and just have a very brief chat about how the condition impacts them, whether it meets the criteria criteria of the definition and then asking those people to provide us with medical verification. Okay? And that's very important because without that medical documentation we can't verify that they are genuinely living with that condition. Okay? So we would ask each person to provide us with a medical certificate whether it's from a doctor, any medical practitioner, so an occupational therapist, a physiotherapist, a speech therapist, somebody that is, has a medical medical practice number, okay? And then once we finalize the process, we will then forward all of the information back to Media24. Um, and that will sort of give them the opportunity to start to explore what their reasonable accommodation needs are now that Media24 have the information. It will be stored with HR. So again, if anybody's talking to you and saying, but if I talk or I tell people, who's gonna know? Okay, because people are going to be concerned that what's that information for? And so it's really important that we let and assure staff and reassure them that it is managed confidentially. And once that information is managed by us, it's back with Media24 HR managers, and that's where it stays. Unless you provide written consent, that information will never be shared. And that's what the law states around that confidentiality, is that the information should never be shared with any other party without your written consent. Okay. So if that allows people to maybe feel a little bit more secure about who they're talking to or how they're sharing that information. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening and participating. And I hope that it was informative. But I just want to let you know there will be an email address and there will be a telephone number that all staff and managers have access to throughout the window period. So that two-week period where we are opening the tool for people to go through the process, there will be a number available and an email.